So my part of this will be to tell a story. We're here because of Brendan and because of the extraordinary and extraordinarily mm -hmm. imaginative and brave and persistent and selfless efforts which he made over two decades, placing extraordinary pressures on his family and those around him to encourage a peaceful resolution of the conflict in the six counties of Ulster. He chose the task for himself. He never gave up, even in periods of acute personal danger or total frustration. <laughs> and his story shows something which most people don't believe. It is that in troubled times, the efforts of private individuals can affect the course of history. Bad times bring out the best in some people. It was inspiring when working on these matters in the North in the early 70s to encounter ordinary people who turned out not to be ordinary at all in the exceptional decency and humanity which led them to stand up against the prevailing need of their communities and to take risks in doing so both for themselves and for their families. I remember Mrs. Spatman and her friends of the Andersonstown Peace Women, the original Peace Women who didn't get any Nobel Prizes, who used to come down to see us at our office in Mainside, driven by Paddy McKillop, and very, many others. There were also people in established positions who shone like beacons of light in the prevailing gloom of bigotry and fear. I would love to list with gratitude and admiration those whom I knew. And I know that Brendan would want me to mention particularly Frank Lagan, who was sometime police commander in Derry, who was a great source of help and encouragement to Brendan and a very special public servant. From my own list, I affectionately remember and gratefully Father Desmond Mullen of Dungiven, who was later Vicar General of the Diocese, who incidentally explained to me that as boys, he and his friends caught foxes for the local farmers and were paid by the weight of the fox, which they would increase by slitting its throat and inserting a few stones before it was weighed. And there were brave politicians, the early leaders of the SDLP, Jerry Fitt, John Hume, Austin Curry, Paddy Devlin, and the unionist leader, Brian Faulkner, were all physically at risk in coming to the secret cross-party talks which we held at Laneside in planning for the Sunningdale power-sharing agreement. After each of those meetings, we used to wonder <clears throat> whether one of them would be killed before the next meeting. But Sunningdale might have drained away the violence if the Aster Workers' strike had not pulled it down, so it was a really worthwhile attempt to move the scenery and change what was going on. To talk of negotiating peace, I would like to make three points and to illustrate them from what I know of Brendan's experience from having been his partner in the early days, though with nothing more than a walk on part in the long journey which followed. The first point is about attitudes to politically motivated violence and the necessary search for understanding. The second is about channels of communication and their value. And the third is about the need for propitious circumstances and political oxygen if peace is to grow. I hope we may agree that politically motivated violence is a more helpful concept than terrorism, let alone the dis deliberate propaganda distortion of the war on terror, which by lumping together differently motivated emanations of violence licenses, for example, the Russian government to visit terror on the inhabitants of Chechnya and its North Caucasian neighbors, and licenses Israel, for example, relying on American support to do terrible things in Gaza. Each emanation of politically motivated violence stems from a different set of circumstances. 20th century violence in Ireland came from circumstances which we all know about. Bombs on buses and trains in 21st century Britain come from disorientated youth seeking validation and responding to British actions in Iraq and Afghanistan and perceived British collusion with regard to Palestine. 
to prepare for negotiating peace, we must seek to identify these different circumstances and the responses to them. We must be humble and recognize our ignorance, abandon preconceptions, avoid moral judgments. The concept of evil is particularly unhelpful. And work hard to understand, even to some extent empathize with, those who choose violence, to try to put themselves, ourselves into their shoes. And then to make a similar effort to put ourselves into the shoes of those who are confronting violence or being affected by it. When I arrived in Northern Ireland to join Whitelaw's staff in, May, in March 1973, the situation was chaotic and understanding motivations was really not a priority. But it was what I had been told to try to do. I inherited some excellent helpers on both sides of the divide from my remarkable predecessor, Frank Steele, who knew Brendan and advised me to look him up at some point. <coughs> and I began an intensive crash course in grassroots politics. My mentor in the nationalist community was a Belfast Republican former Gaelic football player called Joe Malvena, a really marvelous human being whose introductions and wise teaching as we traveled together got me off to the best possible start. And it was thanks to Joe and those I met with him that I began to appreciate the quality of so many of the young people who were joining the provisional IRA as volunteers and to recognize that an organization which could attract such recruits must have thoughtful individuals amongst its leadership with whom it might be possible to engage. Finding my way to them then became my objective. And in due course, after some nerve-wracking experiences, it led me to Brendan, who was said to have some relevant contacts. Brendan turned out to be just what I was looking for in a collaborator, and I truly believe I was the same for him. He was convinced that peace could be achieved through dialogue. I was convinced that peace should be achievable, but was conscious that the British government had no intention of communicating, and that after the politically embarrassing Chelsea meeting of 1972, it had stated publicly that it never would do so. Brendan and I had a very great deal to teach each other at that time about the nature and possibilities and limitations of the situations on either side of the picture. We did this over the following months, <clears throat> meeting regularly in kindly provided discreet circumstances, at sessions which often lasted six hours without a break. They never seemed too long, and I'm convinced that I did most of the listening. The most important things which each of us <coughs> learned were that credible guarantees of confidentiality were available, which was vital from a British point of view, and that there could be a degree of flexibility in interpreting publicly stated positions on either side. This preparatory work and the understanding which it enabled us to convey to, whom, to those whom we were seeking to influence, which was then followed by a period of indirect communication, led in late 1974 to my meeting representatives of the Provisional Army Council in secret sessions arranged and stage managed by Brendan. Our dialogue, in which I was soon joined by one of my colleagues, was conducted in good faith on both sides and led to the Provisional IRA's ceasefire of early 1975, which lasted for a number of months until broken by an upsurge in loyalist suspicion-fueled violence. So for a while, something which had seemed impossible had been achieved, and the achievement, although it was temporary, left a positive legacy. In 1976, after the ceasefire had collapsed, the new British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland decided that everything we had done was wrong and that officials should never again have such contacts. Even from his own point of view, he was mistaken to think that nothing had been gained. The provisional IRA never recovered after the ceasefire the degree of popular support and tolerance for its activities which it had had before. But Brendan and I also agreed that the process of dialogue had created an asset which ought not to be thrown away. Without any authority on my side, we represented to those whom we had, with whom we had worked to bring about the ceasefire 
that while there would now be nothing to talk about, perhaps for years, the link remained in place. Brendan had the key to it. I was at the other end of it, and <coughs> would be wherever I happened to be in the world. And if given a message, I could relay it within hours to the British Prime Minister. Despite the lack of official authority, this was actually true, as we demonstrated in 1980, when an opportunity occurred to bring the first hunger strike to an end. Within 45 minutes of my presenting myself <coughs> unannounced at the Northern Ireland office, after a long overnight conversation with Brendan, and asking to see the Permanent Secretary, Sir Kenneth Stowe, Mrs. Thatcher was brought out of a, <coughs> a Cabinet Committee meeting to give personal authority to support the initiative which we, was, we on, our, on behalf of our contacts, were suggesting. The strike was called off, but tragically the action taken was insufficient to avert the second hunger strike, which then followed. Then, for ten years, <coughs> there were to be no more messages. Somehow, hanging on by his fingernails during all that long time, Brendan managed to preserve our asset and to maintain his connection with the provisional leadership. He worked endlessly to present non-violent alternative strategies and to <coughs> illustrate the political realities of the time. He was varyingly identified as interesting, an interfering nuisance, and possibly a traitor. Apart from knowing that he is marvelously clever and persuasive, I'm at a loss to understand how he survived those long, tedious, <coughs> and sometimes dangerous years, let alone how he survived them in a position of influence. But he did. And in February 1991, he was able to arrange reactivation of the link at a meeting which I attended, <coughs> playing the walk-on part, which I mentioned earlier, and with my movements at the meeting carefully choreographed for me in advance by Brendan. At this meeting, it was agreed that regular secret dialogue should be resumed. Brendan continued to manage that dialogue during further difficult years <coughs> until direct negotiations opened with the formal peace process leading eventually to the Good Friday Agreement. Jonathan Powell, Tony Blair's chief of staff, who managed the later stages of negotiation on behalf of the British government, has said that the Good Friday Agreement would not have happened without the secret work which went before. So it is fair to say that the Good Friday Agreement would not have happened without Brent and Duddy. The possibility of negotiating peace is a feeble flame which won't burn without oxygen. In 1976, there was almost none. For years, the most that Brendan could achieve, and it was a very considerable achievement, was to keep alive the idea of a political alternative and to ensure that just occasionally, from time to time, it was given some consideration. But the armed campaign under new leadership enjoyed a period of spectacular achievement. Warren Point, a campaign on the mainland and in Germany, Brighton, Harrods, and a shell lobbed into the Prime Minister's garden at number 10 Downing Street, those engaged in it were in no mood to give up. Eventually, the British got their act together. Mrs. Thatcher adopted a policy of containing violence at a supposedly tolerable level and provided the resources to achieve it. The British public proved resilient and largely uncaring. Operations of the British security forces became increasingly sophisticated, building on experience and achieving a powerful degree of intelligence penetration. And in many other ways, the climate changed, both at home and abroad. The bitter discontents which had fueled the campaign and attained either support or a degree of acquiescence from significant sections of the local community had also largely fallen away. And so, at that meeting in February 1991, it was possible to agree that an effective stalemate had been reached. The campaign could go on indefinitely, but it could be contained indefinitely too, and it would achieve nothing. A move to political action would offer different opportunities. But the agreement to resume dialogue took the British government by surprise, and although John Major became a powerful supporter of the peace process, the early response of his government under the influence of its right wing and of the Ulster Unionist members of Parliament on whom he effectively depended for his majority 
was both suspicious and hostile. Unforeseen hurdles and barriers were placed in the path of Sinn Féin IRA's move towards peace. And the process, interrupted by an inevitable response to this in the form of the doctrine's bomb, very nearly collapsed. Brendan nursed it back to health, and at last it became formally and openly established. But even as late as December 1991, 1999, with the all-party talks in London under Senator Mitchell in full swing, there was a danger that it might still be derailed over spurious arguments about decommissioning. The strength of the cynical, sceptical political opposition to dialogue, which had to be overcome, further emphasises the importance of Brendan's achievement. Until 1991, the British government had been content with its policy of containment. It was effective. It had largely removed the topic from public concern. There was no political mileage in changing it, and there would be serious risks in doing so. But Brendan's work and the February 1991 meeting, which he orchestrated, gave them no option. It presented them with a fait accompli. These people are offering to talk with a view to ending their armed campaign. It was an offer which could not be refused, and everything flowed from that moment. Well, that's the story. <clears throat> there are lessons in this story. One would wish to see them applied in Palestine. They will not be while Israel enjoys unconditional support from the United States. In Gaza today, there is little opportunity for young people to envisage a normal life. For too many young people of spirit there, the only option they will see increasingly is violence, and violence spreads. It's more than time for European governments, and particularly Britain, but also Ireland, to take a truly independent stance on that issue. Thank you. <laughs>